are going to be in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. Let's read the word of the Lord. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again today um, for the pulpit. I want to thank you for the joy and the gravity of preaching your word. And I ask, Lord, by the power of your spirit through your word that you would remind us of the gift of our union with you, that through your word you would teach us to abide with you, that through your word by your spirit you would empower us and encourage us to obey your word. I pray that you would show us again the wonder of what it means that we are going to be conformed to the image of Christ. And so would you again today bring some some light and some heat to these words um, that I have prepared And would you grant me the grace um, of your spirit moving, Um, grant me the grace of these rough and and raw uh, words of mine um, to present something beautiful and precious and fine and true. Would your gospel be seen? Lord Jesus, would we make much of you today? It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Well, just a few days ago, uh, I was writing this sermon in Hell's Kitchen. Um, Hell's Kitchen um, is a neighborhood, um, kind of mid, midtown area of Manhattan. Used to be one of the, the roughest neighborhoods in, in the country. It's not as rough as it once was. It's, uh, it's a bit hip now. It's, it's savvy now, but it's got its, it's, got its rough spots for, for sure. Um, But there I was, um, working on the sermon and experiencing viscerally um, of the truth that we're going to talk about today. I had a felt experience of the truth that we are going to talk about today. And the truth is something that I imagine you all know. It's pretty simple. It's pretty simple. And it's this. A good tour guide makes all the difference, right? Right? A good tour guide makes all the difference. Now, being in the immensity and the intensity of New York City for the first time, well, it makes you feel a bit swallowed up, right? Everything seems to be going on around you, but you still feel like you're missing everything because everything is going on around you and you don't know what to take in. It's overwhelming. So I sat there in the small coffee shop and I began writing this sermon, I hadn't yet met up with a friend of mine who would show me the city, who would show me some, some gyms of, of restaurants to eat at and coffee shops to visit and to tell me some incredible stories. And so what that meant was I was walking blindly past hundreds of shops, hundreds of restaurants, moving on quickly past stories and, and historic things that I was completely unaware of. I was a stranger to the glories and to the grit of the city that was all around me. I couldn't see what I was missing. I needed a good tour guide to show me around. A good tour guide makes all the difference. So later that day, I met up with a friend, and he showed me around, and my experience of the city opened up. It just bloomed. We walked and walked, and he talked, and he pointed at this, and then he pointed at that, and he told stories, and he shared his knowledge about that diner that I had walked by like three times already. I had completely ignored. He said, that's the diner where, where Seinfeld sat, and they came up with the idea in that booth for the show Seinfeld. I was like, oh, well, that's cool. I had no clue. I walked by that thing three times. And then he said, that pizzeria over there. I said, that's special. Laren knows this. That pizzeria. That, that, that's, that's Simpson's Tabernacle. That's, that's where the famous pastor A.B. Simpson preached. And the spirit moved, and now it's a pizzeria. It smelled so good. And he said, this church, this church over here, 
it's now a theater. And it was once one of the, the city's most risque and controversial bars. He said it was once a church. And, and man, that church was pastored by this, this theologian pastor who cared for the poor in the city during its roughest times. And he was so influential. He influenced, he influenced this guy named Martin Luther King Jr. And it changed the shape of his theology and it changed the shape of our nation. And that, that was happening right here. Boom, the city exploded. A good tour guide makes all the difference. Well, let's do this. Let me change the location. Let's go from Hell's Kitchen to the promised land. That's, that's a good move for most people, right? Um, I want introduce, to introduce you to Yuval and Mahanid, okay? Years ago, on my second trip to Israel, I met a gentleman named Yuval. Now, Yuval is a sabra, um, which is a Hebrew word that means prickly pear. It's a cactus, right? <clears throat> All prickly on the outside, but just soft and gooey, like just this a mushy heart on the inside. And he is a brilliant guide, the best of the best. As we explored sites up and down Israel, from, from the northernmost point, from the heights of Hermon and Dan, all the way to uh, the, the southern part, to the, the crystalline and, and turquoise shores, of the Dead Sea, he would explain things, and he would open things up for us. See, he was a native to the land. He knew it. He was a soldier in the Israeli Defense Force, and he was one of the paratroopers who was one of the first ones in to the city of Jerusalem in the Six-Day War when they took back Jerusalem. He was one of the first ones in there, so he knew stuff, right? He New stuff. He had intimate knowledge of the people, intimate knowledge of the land, intimate knowledge of the glories and the atrocities. He drew out the meaning hidden in things and he shared them with us. He exposed truths that we could not have discovered by ourselves. A good tour guide makes all the difference. And then there's our friend Mohanad. Mohanad has one of the best smiles and most infectious laughs uh, in, in the world. He's amazing. He is, uh, he's Jordanian. He is a stellar tour guide, and more so, he happens to be the son of the sheik of Petra, which means when you're traveling with him, you get to see things that you don't normally get to see. One day while we were staying in the city of Petra, he says, dress, dress warmly for tonight. I got something for you. And what, what do you got for us? A joyous secret, he said with a smile. Just kept it at that. So we got on the bus, twilight, and we get on the bus, and we drive out um, uh, into the, the wilderness area there and drive out into the darkness. Where are we going? Everyone's wondering where we're going. And then eventually we see a little glow ahead of us, and as we get closer, the glow grows brighter, and as we get closer, we see that that glow is, is, is a lantern, and, and you can tell that we're about to turn into this um, little kind of sandstone valley. And so, so we do, we turn into that sandstone valley, and we, we pass a bend, we pass a bend, and then the desert's darkness gave way to brilliant light, and everyone was like, ah, ooh, ah, and like leaned towards their windows and was looking out of this bus. See, we were in a small sandstone canyon that was lit by the light of hundreds of lanterns that were hung on the walls created this glorious, eerie effect, and then, you know, we drove further in and further in until the bus stopped at a crowd of people that was dancing, and there was music, and there we were met by some um, very hospitable Bedouins who greeted us with their music, who greeted us with their hugs, and then they led us to their, their humble tents, and there in those humble tents were tables of food, you guys were there. It's like so hard to explain, like the glory of the food that was on these tables, like like warm falafels, like fresh hummus that was ground up that day, fresh vegetables, meat kebabs, desserts that I don't even have words for. I just know that they were shot through with honey and dates and goodness, right? And so we just ate and we laughed and we talked. It was incredible. And then and then they bring out the swords. 
and they do a traditional sword dance. And then they get us dancing around the firelight with them. I'm looking like an idiot trying to do some traditional sword dance. And it was the most glorious thing. Now, here's the deal. I felt like we'd walked into a movie. I'm pretty sure it was like an Indiana Jones set that I was on, right? Why am I telling you this? Because we feasted like royalty, dancing around a fire with Bedouins, under the stars of the Jordanian sky. And we left that night full, man, our bellies, our hearts, our heads, and we knew that we had experienced a gift, an incredible gift, a grace that we didn't even know existed, and we wouldn't have known it existed unless our tour guide got us ready and took us there and showed us the glories that awaited us. A good tour guide makes all the difference. Why do I go on about this? Well, it's so we can see a bit clearer what Jesus has to teach us about the Holy Spirit. Now, my friend in New York City and Yuval and Israel and Mohammed from Petra, they can show you wonderful things. They can show you amazing things. They can show you beautiful things. But how much more can the Spirit of God who knows all the contours of creation, who knows the secrets of the deep things, who knows the fellowship of the Father, who knows the splendors of the Son, how much more can he reveal the glories to us? How much more? See, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is glory's tour guide. And that's what I want us to see today. The Holy Spirit is glory's tour guide. Did you see it in our passage? The Spirit as our tour guide. Let's look again at those verses. Verses 12 through 13. Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Now the context of this passage, context is always important, it's always key, it's Jesus' farewell discourse. And what that means is that Jesus and his crew ha- have just finished up uh, the Last Supper. And it means they're on the road. They're on the streets of Jerusalem. It means they're walking to the Garden of Gethsemane. They're walking to that garden where Jesus will, will pray and sweat and bleed and then be violently seized and arrested. But what this means is that as Jesus is talking, they are on a journey. They are walking, and Jesus is giving them a master class and apprenticeship to him. Now, a key teaching of this master class on being his apprentices is that uh, apprentices of Jesus are those in whom the Spirit indwells. Those in whom the Spirit indwells and leads and guides. And Jesus says, I, I, I have all sorts of things to say, but, but you all can't process it now. Your hearts and your minds can't integrate it until, until something happens, uh, until I go to the cross, uh, until, until I break the bonds of death and, and until I ascend, you won't be able to integrate these things because there are some things that must be made known only in retrospect. There are some things that must be made known only in retrospect. And at the right time, Jesus will send his spirit to them to show them what happened so that it would make sense of it all. He will send his spirit, right, to open their eyes to who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to continue to do. But here's a question I have. What does he mean, all truth? He's going to lead them into all the truth. What does that mean? Well, let's read well here. Reading well is very important, so let's read this well. What we're going to see is that this phrase, all truth or all the truth, is aimed at something specific. It's aimed at something specific. He's not simply saying that the Spirit is going to come and teach you and give you all the data about echinoderms and starfish and how they can regenerate their limbs, you know, or sea anemones or sea cucumbers. And he's not just going to come and give you a bunch of information on Arctic environments and the amazing inhabitants that live in those severe landscapes or quantum physics and all the mysteries. He can. I mean, he's the God of all creation. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth, but read on with me, verse 13. Let's read well. Verse 13, he says, For he, parentheses, 
Recall the spirit is a who, not simply a what, but a who, okay? For he, he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So he will make known what he hears, the the spirit will make known to us what he hears in the conversation between the father and the son. He's this awesome divine eavesdropper, so to speak. Well, he's in on the conversation, but you get it. And so he's going to show us what the Father and the Son are up to in the events that will happen. The death and resurrection. And then he makes it a bit clearer. He opens it up some more. Look at verses 14 and 15. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. He will glorify Jesus. So here's how it works. See, Jesus makes known the Father to us. Um, And the Spirit makes known Jesus to us. You know, we talked about this before. You've all seen... Beautiful houses and their glorious landscaping all lit up at night, right? You've driven by some of those houses where there's spotlights or floodlights that are hidden in the yard. And you don't see the lights themselves, but you see the light and you see what it's shining on. This gorgeous, beautiful architecture. Right? Those spotlights, those floodlights, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To wash this glorious architecture, this home of Jesus Christ, to light it up so we see it and go, wow. Look at him. Look at him. So that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus shines too. Jesus shines his light and says, look at the Father. Look at the architect of this architecture. He's amazing. Man. So, I have this little chart. We've showed this before. Um, I, I edited it a little bit, and it might seem wrong, but I believe it's right. And it goes like this. The Father delights in and displays the Son through his Spirit. And that Spirit delights in and displays the Son. And the Son delights in and displays the Father. This is an eternal love relationship of mutual delight, and forever shared glory. This is the Trinity. This is the triune God who ever was love, ever is love, and ever will be love. Perfect, mutual, honoring joy and delight and satisfaction. And that's what we are drawn into as apprentices of Jesus. And what Jesus teaches us in this passage today that after the Garden of Gethsemane, that after the cross of Calvary, that after the tomb in that dark garden, that after his ascension to the throne, he will send his spirit to spotlight, to floodlight who he is and what he's done and what he will do because, because in seeing Jesus, we see God. And seeing Jesus, we see God. What is God like? Look at Jesus. What would God the Father do if he were here? Look at, look at Jesus. How would God respond in this situation? Look at Jesus. And the Holy Spirit shows us Jesus. So the apprentices of Jesus had not seen all of his beauty in those three years that he was here. They caught a glimpse of his beauty, right? They certainly caught a glimpse of his beauty in those three years. But there was infinitely more to see. There was more to behold. There was was more to wonder at. They saw a drop of the eternal oceans of glory that are in Jesus Christ. They saw a sliver of the splendor of who he is. There was more There's always more to know of this king of glory. And this is what the Spirit does. The Spirit spotlights the splendors of Jesus. The Spirit is the tour guide to the glories of our Savior. He will glorify me, Jesus says. He will glorify 
me. Now glory. Let's pause here. Glory. How do we understand or experience that word glory? Because I'm sure we have a bunch of different angles coming at, at the understanding of it. How do we experience or understand it? Well, I'll do it this way. This will, this will be brief. But um, in Greek, it's this word doxa. Um, and the word doxa basically means to have the right um, opinion or estimation or worth of something. It's, it's to, it's to um, understand something in accordance with its worth. Okay? So um, uh, an easy and I think helpful one-word translation of doxa for glory is, is uh, worth or worthy. Um, the, the Hebrew term is, is kavod. And kavod, if there's a one-word way to translate that besides glory, it would be weighty or weight. And the idea here is that um, something has a weightiness to it, a substance to it that speaks of its worth, that speaks of its value, that shows the treasure that it is, that speaks of the honor and adoration that something is, is due. And then it's often seen in a bright or shiny way. So do this with me. Think of um, a child's toy. Think of a plastic gold coin. Okay, my kids have all these different, like, fake pennies and fake quarters. But think of, like, a, um, a fake gold coin. And it's just plastic. It's thin. It's, it's chintzy. Now, think of a thick Spanish doubloon that was salvaged from the depths of the ocean. A thick, heavy piece of metal that when you drop it, it hits with a thud, right? Now, one of those, you would spend a lot of money to obtain. The other one, you wouldn't miss it if you threw it away. Glory, weight, and worth. Weight and worth. And, and one of the ways that you could sum up glory, I'll, I'll kind of put it into my, my own words here, it's this, it's, it's worth shining forth. Glory is worth shining forth. It's when God goes public with his beauty and his goodness. Worth shining forth. See, we're glory blind. We are glory blind in our sinful state. Just like a woman, a blind woman who cannot see the glory of, of molten gold and oozing crimson sunset, just like she can't see that, sin has blinded us to the, the gold of King Jesus, to the oozing scarlet of who he is. We can't see the goodness and the truth of who he is until the Spirit opens our eyes. And so the ministry of the Spirit is to unblind us is to help us see reality, to help us see the beauty of the Father by seeing the beauty of the Son and drawing us into the, the goodness of it all. His ministry is to heal our eyes and to guide us to that which is glorious. And so we know the Spirit is in operation. We know the Spirit is in operation when the glory of Jesus is being seen, when he is made much of. Someone who's walking in step with the Spirit is someone whose eyes are being opened to the bright glory of Jesus. Someone who is learning to live in wonder, like, like a, a, a little kid, right, who gasps and oohs and awes at, at the grandeur of the gospel. Look at that. Did you, did you see this, this thing that Jesus did? Watch him do this. Look at the curious brightness of his life. Look at the radiance of resurrection Sunday. Look at the strange glow of his crucifixion. Look. Look at the brilliance of the dawn of the new world that dawned the day that he rose from the dead. Look at this, Jesus. Show up, Jesus. Show up. That's, that's what the Spirit does. Is he has Jesus show up, so to speak, that we would see him. So, we know this, by the way. I want, I want to say this. Um, we know that this is the point of the scriptures, right? That this is the point of the Bible. Old Testament and New, to show us the glories of 
Jesus, that we might rightfully see our heavenly Father. All the scriptures work together to say essentially what, what Pilate said, behold the man, behold the man. The Bible is the God-breathed, humanity-pinned, story-shaped library that leads to encountering Jesus Christ. From Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, we are beckoned by the story to behold the man who is God, the Christ who shows us the Father. To see God in Jesus, that is what the Spirit is about. And you know, that's what sermons are for too, right? That's what sermons are for too. A sermon is a reveling in Jesus. A sermon is like somebody standing in in the the burning sunlight with a a gym going, look, and turning it so you see the brightness of all the different facets and go, behold, the living gem that is Jesus Christ. Look at his beauty. Because Jesus is not an ornament on a life hack church TED talk thing called a sermon. Jesus is the shimmering essence of the sermon's very existence. He's why we're here. He's why we're here. And so I want to say this. A pulpit that doesn't point to Jesus is not a pulpit. It's it's a pundit's podium. (laughs) And it's powerless unless the Spirit is at work and Jesus is proclaimed and the Father is glorified. And so I think you can identify a powerless pulpit by one that does not make much of Jesus. A spirit-filled pulpit, a spirit-filled church is one that spotlights Jesus. Now, this is why Paul said that it was Christ crucified that he preached. It's Christ crucified that I preach, he said. His message was always Jesus Christ. That's what he was about, the message of Jesus. And and with that said, I want to turn to the book of Hebrews here. I'm not saying Paul wrote Hebrews, but I'm turning to the book of Hebrews Um, And I want to read a verse here for you because I think it spotlights who Jesus is brilliantly. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Let's just let, let's just let the word minister to to our hearts. Because these words were written by the Spirit and the Spirit spotlights Jesus. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty